Well, good evening. Go ahead and make your way to the Gospel according to Matthew tonight. The Gospel according to Matthew, chapter number 4. Chapter number 4, in just a moment, I want us to look at verses 23 through 25. And I mentioned last time that since we were only a couple of weeks away from our summer break on Wednesday night, that we would uh, hold off from beginning a new book. And uh, tonight, I, I just it's a very short passage. It's um, about the ministry of our Lord. It's really a, a summary of his ministry there in Galilee. Um, in some ways, just a summary of his public ministry. And that's where I want to focus in tonight. So Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 through 25, and Matthew records that Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread throughout all Syria. And they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee and the Decapolis and Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond the Jordan. And this is the word of our Lord. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we give thanks for this portion of your word and we recognize, Lord, that it was given to us by your servant Matthew and written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so, Father, we ask that just as your spirit ministered to Matthew in the recording of this account, we ask that you would, through your spirit, aid us in our understanding of your word. Lord, we ask that you would help us not only to, to spiritually apprehend these truths about our Lord, but that your spirit would cause them to produce fruit in our lives. We ask that you would do this for your glory and for our good. For the advancement of your kingdom, for it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, in this passage, Matthew gives a summary of our Lord's ministry in Galilee. In fact, it's really, as you look at it, it's not hard to see the way that it lines up there, speaking of his ministry. It's almost leaping off the page. You notice that in verse number 23, you see the pattern for his ministry. Do you see that right there in verse 23? The teaching and the preaching and the healing. That that's the pattern of our Lord's ministry. And then you see in verse 24, you see the people's response to his ministry. You see his uh, fame. The news about him spread all throughout Syria. You also see that the people were bringing the sick to him to be healed. And in verse number 25, we see that they responded in large crowds. And so it, it, as you look at that, it's really just a kind of easy way to look at this passage. You have the pattern of our Lord's ministry and the people's response. But I, I, what I'd like to do, well, and that's very simple, but what I'd like to do is really Instead of just expounding upon that, I, we're going to talk about that some, but really I just want to get into some of the more instructive things that come from this. We could just take those points and, and highlight that, but there's something in here that I want us to see. In other words, we want to scratch just a little bit below the surface and, and, and see, while it's not directly said, something that is there that we often miss. And so three, three things that I, I would want to point out. And, and the first thing that I would have us to notice this is the uniqueness of our God. And, and I start there because that's where Matthew starts with Jesus. And it's important to notice that it was Jesus who was going throughout all of Galilee. That he was the one that was teaching and he was the one that was proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. And he was the one that was healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. This is the God-man. This is God in the flesh. God incarnate, if you will. And I just 
because sometimes we're reading this and we're reading, it's a story about Jesus, but, but just think about that for a moment. Just, just allow your mind to think about that, that this is the, the second person of the triune Godhead in heaven, object of worship. I mean, all, all the angels are, are, are crying out and, and worshiping God. And we see here such a contrast to the way that people often think about God and even you think about some of the, the views about God. This is our God. This is our God in the flesh. They're walking among the people, ministering. I mean, can, can you just get that in your mind for a moment? I mean, that's radical to think about that, that he would take upon flesh and he would walk among us, and that he would minister to those in need. It's so different than the Greek mythological god of, of Zeus or the impersonal uh, false god of the Muslims. Our, our God is compassionate. Uh, he, he's described elsewhere as looking on a, on a crowd and uh, referring to them as sheep without a shepherd. And then he feeds them. Our God is personal, laying hands on the sick and disease, willing to heal. And our God is generous. I mean, think about the money that someone could make, and yet that's not our God. Our, our God going among the sick and the disease, they're being compassionate, being merciful, and the list goes on and on. And, and I think it's a truth that we just need to think on, meditate on his, his mercy and his loving kindness. And, and it's remarkable to consider that he would do this. Now, was there purpose in all of this? Certainly there is. I, I know sometimes the, the, the argument is, well, yeah, but I mean, this was part of what the prophet said in, in, as looking to the ministry of Jesus, the, the Messiah who was to come. I mean, this is, these were the things we were supposed to be looking for, that he is healing. But let's be, remind, let's be mindful that it is God who wrote the script. He could have done it another way, but this is how he chose to reveal himself. Yes, the Messiah would be recognized by these signs. And these are his credentials, so to speak. But we see that this is the way that he chose to reveal himself. Coming as a a shepherd, if you will, very compassionate, personal, and humble, uh, seeking to save that which is lost. And you see the uniqueness of him, and as you think about our Lord Jesus, certainly we see that he makes it very clear, and the gospel writers want to make this very clear, that Jesus was not just an ordinary man, that he is the Son of God, that he is uh, God in the flesh. And so when we're asking you, thinking, what, what is our Heavenly Father like? Well, this is what He's like. This is what He's like. This is Him among us. Jesus said in John 12, 45, that he who sees me sees the one who sent me. In John 1, 18, we're told that Jesus has explained Him. No one has seen God at any time, but Jesus has explained Him. He's, he's, he's revealed Him to us. He's made known who God is. What is God like? Again, we need only look at Jesus. John 14, 7, if you had known me, Jesus says, you would have known my Father also. Colossians 1, 15 tells us that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. And Hebrews 1.3 says that he is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his purpose, his power. Who, 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 what is God like? This is him. This is, this is our God. Compassionate, merciful. So we're not like the world who wonders and and even falsely assumes who God is. We, we know who he is. He has revealed himself in the person of Jesus Christ. So, so here we read of him, God himself ministering to the people. 
And then we see the pattern there in verse 23 that he was going through all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. Three, threefold pattern for ministry. Just very briefly, just, just kind of highlight what he was doing. He's teaching in the synagogue. He's imparting in more detailed instructions the, in, the, in the synagogues. As he's making the proclamation that he's making everywhere about the kingdom has come, he's, he's giving instruction in the synagogues, and he's, he's showing them how it was rooted in the Old Testament showing how it flowed out of God's covenant promises in the Old Testament. That God's revelation that was given to to Moses and the prophets. And so in the the synagogues, he's he's teaching. And his purpose was to instruct the hearts of the people that they might know that his message was a scriptural message, a message which came from God. And then he's, he's proclaiming or preaching the kingdom. He's... He's heralding, if you will, announcing that the kingdom is here. In other words, it's not simply that he desired to, to teach and instruct them, but he, he calls them to respond. That, that is what the proclamation of the kingdom is, is that we're, we're calling people to embrace the kingdom, to respond, to acknowledge God's rule in their life, to repent of sin and to, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. So he not only wanted them to learn something, but he wanted them to do something. And that's what the call, this proclamation of the gospel is. It's more than just a mental acknowledgement that the kingdom is here. It calls us to to action, that is to to submit to his rule and his dominion. First in our heart, and then that's manifested in our lives. And then thirdly, we're told that he went about doing the work of healing. So he had a healing ministry. And, and obviously we see in that, again, that the credentials of the Messiah. But it's a reminder that as he's healing, you see God is concerned about man and his condition. And we see that in the Lord Jesus as he heals the, the sick. And they were bringing all kinds to him. It's a reminder for us that one day that we all will be healed. That all of us who are believers in Christ will be completely healed. And do y'all think about that? The older I get, I, the more I think about that. I mean, we, we are going to be completely healed. I mean, he has redeemed our soul, but he's redeemed all of us. And then that glorified body, that which he has purchased by his blood, we will be completely healed. Sometimes he doesn't heal. That's a, that's a stumbling block for some. And, 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 and we understand this from Scripture that sometimes he doesn't heal. In the case of the Apostle Paul, whatever you make of that thorn in the flesh, whatever it may have been. For Paul, it was a reminder that God's grace is sufficient. And sometimes for us, he does that for our sake, that we would know the power of the Lord in that regard, but then sometimes he does it heal us because of the sake of others. He uses our infirmities to to minister to others, that we're able to come along beside others and talk about the grace and the goodness of God. By the way, we don't talk enough about the goodness of God. I was sharing with my granddaughter a few weeks ago. I, I was driving her to a softball game. She, I want to say she's eight years old. It's kind of getting harder to keep up with some of them, but I think she's eight years old, and we were on the way. And, and, I, and I had talked to her before, a couple of weeks before, I was talking to her about sin. And, uh, and we talked much about that, and, and I had prepared that, that as I'm driving her this occasion, what, what am I going to talk to her about? And I, and I thought, you know, I want to talk to her about the goodness of God, just, just how good God is and, and how gracious he is and, 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 and also talk about his otherness, his holiness. And, and so we're driving down the road and, and I'm telling her about the goodness of God and, and, uh, 
how good he is. And I said, you know, God is, is so good. And I talked about the, the ways that he's blessed us, but then I talked about, you know, he, he is so different from us. I mean, God has never, ever sinned. He's never done any wrong at all. And I labored that point. And my eight-year-old granddaughter, she said, he's, he's never sinned, never, never, never done anything wrong. And, and I said, no, he, he's never, ever done anything wrong. And she said, not even a long time ago. <laughs> I said, not even a long time ago. He's always the same. And, and, and we need that truth. He's always the same. And, and when we're looking at Jesus, be mindful that this is God in the flesh. And he's always the same. This, this is not a different God in the New Testament than the Old Testament. This is the same God. We could make an argument. There's, there's, there's maybe even more grace in the Old Testament. But certainly we see the Lord Jesus in his ministry of healing and proclaiming the gospel and teaching. And so you, you, you see this about him. He is unique. He is different. And sometimes it's hard for us as we talk about the goodness of God and we talk about who he is. Part of that is not just looking at this from the perspective of one fold, but we, this is the, the, the pattern for the church as well, that we have a teaching ministry, that we have a, a, a preaching ministry of proclam, proclaiming the gospel, and we also have a healing ministry ministry. And by that, I mean we don't heal like Jesus healed, but we do heal in the sense that we try to meet the needs of others and point them to Jesus, who can meet their greatest need. But this proclamation of the gospel is a part of that, recognizing the, the, the dominion of, of Christ. And oftentimes it's met with adversity. I was sharing with a, a couple of you recently that I preached a a wedding. And after the wedding was over with, a, a man caught up with me in the parking lot and he began to question. I had referenced the Apostle Paul in my, in my message that I was sharing with the couple there. And, and he began to, get, began to question that and, and then began to press in a little bit further. And, and, uh, uh, and really, it, it became very clear that he did not believe as I believed. And, and I was doing my best to share the gospel with him. And he said, well, I'm just going to tell you. He said, you know, let me just tell you what the demise of evangelicals and Christianity is going to be. And I said, okay, go, go ahead, go ahead. And, and, and he said, you, you guys are too exclusive. That, that, that's your problem. You have no tolerance for, for any other religion or any other kind of thinking or any kind of way. And... And he said, you, you, you know, you guys are just too exclusive, and that's going to be the end of Christianity. And I said, well, you do understand that we follow the most exclusive man to ever walk the face of the earth, the God-man. That we follow the one who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. And he said, well, I have to agree to disagree. Did, did he respond? Well, yeah, he responded. He didn't respond in faith. This message of the gospel is offensive for some. It is a, an exclusive message because it points to the person of Jesus and it points to the Son of God and that it is only through him that we can come to the Father. And it is through Jesus that we learn about who the Father is, what he's like, and we see in this the compassion and mercy of him. But then I want you to notice not only thinking about the uniqueness of our God, but in many ways, as you look at the second section, is that people are pretty much the same. While our God is unique, people are pretty much the same. Notice that Verse number 24, that it said that news about him spread throughout all Syria. This is before Twitter, and they didn't have any Facebook or any kind of newspaper to speak of. All, that, all that's happening is word of mouth. And yet, through word of mouth, I can hear 
them talking about this one in Galilee who is doing these miracles. People pretty much the same in that regard. It spread throughout all Syria, and, and, and they brought to him all who were ill. The second thing I would just note about people is that they're willing to go long distances for help. I mean, if you, if you tell me that there's a way to heal this disease, I will go as far as I have to go. And we see that. I mean, you see that. Some of you have that testimony that you've gone thousands of miles to get help. People move to Atlanta because some of the best hospitals in the world are here. People will go to Mexico or other places to get different kinds of treatment. People will go a long way to get healed, to find some kind of healing. And we see there the various diseases that they have, and the, the, there's a, a, a plethora of, of, of different kind of suffering and illnesses that they were going through. But they were coming to him. And they were bringing their sick to him to heal them. And why is it that everyone doesn't come? Well, some people are happy and healthy and they don't need Jesus. They don't think they do. And, and the point being that sometimes it is through these sicknesses that the Lord uses those things in the lives of unbelievers to bring them to their knees and to show them their vulnerability and show them that they need something outside of themselves. And we should see that for what it is. Now, is it a result or a consequence of the fall? Yes, it is. Yes, we know that. But God uses this, these infirmities in the lives of others. And as a church, I think we have to be ready for those times. We need to be ready and be able to speak to those occasions and, 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 and talk to those people about their sickness. And I recall a young woman who, in the last church that I was serving in, she had come and her child was uh, very sick to the point of death. And she was coming looking for answers. And she was wanting to negotiate with God. You know, I, I'll, I'll just bring him in, I'll put him in church, and, 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 and we'll, we'll go to church, and, and, and we'll be here if God would just heal this child. And I said, well, it didn't work that way. I mean, you, you can't, we have nothing to barter with God. But we come and we bring them to the Lord. I'd, I'd like to say that that child lived, that child died. And sometimes that happens. And as the church, we need to be able to answer and respond to those things when they do. But God uses those infirmities. He uses those sicknesses. Now, to be sure that there are some people who only want a physical cure. That's all they want. And there's still such a thing as foxhole religion. I've seen this uh, from experience. I, I remember a coworker years ago who was going through cancer and, and all of a sudden was in church and, and was really pursuing the Lord and then his cancer went in remission, and that, to my knowledge, he's never been back again. He, he just wanted a fix. He just wanted to be physically healed. And, and we need to understand that there are some that that's all they want. But there are some that God brings into the fold through these infirmities, that he's causing all things to work together for good for those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. And sometimes it's in the midst of those infirmity that he does call them unto himself. And as a church, we need to be prepared and ready when they do come. And why doesn't he heal everyone? Well, we've talked about that some. He doesn't heal all. And for many, it's a stumbling block that they never get past. But he... He spiritually heals all who come to him in faith. The last thing I would just have you to note, and, and, and along those regards, there are large crowds, and certainly there are large crowds that follow Jesus. You know, it's interesting, just, just, just a, a side note here, that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, do you see the contrast? Everybody's there at the beginning. But when he's at the cross, even his closest followers desert. 
Not everybody stays. But the last thing I would just have to mention here is the uniqueness of his ministry. Two, two, th two things I would highlight. We could go through those various diseases, but I, I just want to look at the epileptics and the, uh, the paralytics. Well, the epileptics and the demoniacs that are mentioned there. And epilepsy, I mean, you think about the, in our Lord's day, in the first century, I mean, it was considered to be the greatest disease of the mind that anyone could have. The convulsion, which one was thrown into, was considered a disorder of the mind. It was considered to be a form of lunacy. And, and no one knew how to treat it. And Jesus comes with a word. And it's gone. He, all, all he needs to do is speak the word, and, and, and it's gone. But the demoniacs, I, I, I want to emphasize that because there's something that we see at the beginning of Matthew, and it plays its way out through the gospel account. And that is something that the church needs to be reminded of today, is that when Jesus is coming, one of the things that's emphasized here by being able to cast out demons and and having dominion over them is that Jesus is, is coming, that his, he's doing his redemptive work of destroying the kingdom of Satan. That no longer would Satan have sway over the people, over their hearts and dominion of sin. The strong man, Jesus is coming. This is what we see in this, and he's taking dominion. He's destroying the works of the devil. It's emphasized throughout Matthew, you see that. And, and I say that to say that this is the kingdom of God when it speaks of the kingdom of God being at hand, and certainly we would understand that, that Jesus is ruling and reigning in our hearts, but what we should see in this is that he's taking dominion over the world and has done so, and that sovereignly he rules and reigns. And what I'm saying to us today is that there's nothing in this world that is outside the realm and the rule of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is nothing that is off limits, and there is no one that he cannot heal and save. He has dominion. He is the sovereign king. And church, we ought to act like he is our king, and that he's the one that's ruling the world. And don't get caught up in the politics and what's going on on the local newscast. No, pick up your Bible and be reminded that God is ruling and reigning in the person of Jesus Christ. And he has dominion. And we need to, as servants of the king, we need to exercise that dominion. Not only here in the church, but throughout Holly Springs, Cherokee County, Georgia, United States, throughout the world, because Jesus is King. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you how it reveals who you are, the compassion, the mercy, and the love that you have for people. We thank you that it reveals that you are faithful to keep the promises that you have given. Even those promises that were given to the prophets centuries before of how the Messiah would come. And we thank you, Lord, that Satan no longer has dominion and rule over us but that we have been translated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, and that we are your servants. And I pray, Lord, that we, equipped with the gospel of the kingdom, would go out and slay those who come in contact with us by your gospel of grace, that they too may be your servants and under your rule and your dominion. This we pray 
for the glory of God. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.